good afternoon and uh, welcome everyone to Samaritan's Purse International Health Forum. Uh, we are uh, thrilled to have you join us this afternoon and uh, discuss uh, malaria. Um, and uh, let me just uh, start off. Um, we're going to open up uh, in a word of prayer, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Beth Thompson. Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity to come and um, just learn together. Lord, we pray that you would make this a productive time, Lord, that we would um, just be able to engage and learn what you have to say with us. Bless Dr. Lane's presentation, Father. May you just uh, speak to us today. We thank you for this opportunity and um, just go before us. Amen. All right. Well, as I said, we are thrilled to have you join us today. I really want to uh, encourage you uh, to uh, engage with us in conversation as we uh, uh, present uh, today with regard to malaria. I just want to point out that there is a chat box. Uh, if you have a question during the presentation, please uh, just pose your question in the chat box and we'll try and address it uh, as we are able. Um, we are very informal, so we encourage you to do that. Uh, at the end, there will be a, a, a time dedicated uh, to questions and answers, too, so uh, any questions that we're unable to answer during the presentation, we will address at the end. Um, Today we're very thrilled uh, to have uh, Dr. Richard Lane, and I'm going to introduce him. Dr. Lane is the uh, director of Liberty's University uh, Public Health Program. Uh, during his uh, tenure at Liberty, uh, Dr. Lane has engaged in a number of missions related uh, endeavors to address disease burden uh, in developing uh, regions and uh, throughout the world as a platform for, glo uh, for global gospel outreach. His travels have taken him to over 50 nations, so he's very, uh, uh, has very experienced in traveling around the world. In addition to uh, his academic work, Dr. Lane serves as the lead medical trainer for the Crossroads Global Team, uh, a program designed to address HIV-AIDS epidemic through CRU, which is formerly uh, regarded as uh, Campus Crusade for Christ. Dr. Lane also serves as an executive board member for Freedom 424, which is a ministry against sex trafficking, and is a medical consultant and an advisory board member uh, for World Help, which is a locally based uh, Christian uh, relief and humanitarian organization. Recently, Dr. Lane helped launch the International Help, which is a sustainable health uh, education initiative uh, designed to empower local people with uh, valid health information and skills. So. Uh, Dr. Lane is, uh, is uh, very busy and has made great contributions uh, in uh, public health and humanitarian work and is uh, very experienced. And so today, uh, Dr. Lane is going to be discussing the topic, Malaria Then and Now, the Ever-Changing World for the Prevention, Diagnosis, and Treatment of Plasmodium. And so without further ado, Dr. Lane, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for having me. Uh, what Lance didn't tell you is that my foray into uh, the medical uh, work in tropical areas came when the Air Force sent me off to get a Master's of Public Health in Tropical Medicine. And I was seeing people come back with malaria and became interested in it. And so I pursued that. And it was the beginning of the end of my Air Force experience and my shift over uh, to uh, the Liberty University and to public health here at the school. So if we can bring up the uh, first slide, uh, I want to show you something from the military. And this is back in World War II. And it says these men didn't take their atabrine. Um, atabrine was a new drug back then. Uh, it was developed actually by the Bayer Corporation in Germany. And kind of ironically, Bayer Company developed all the chemicals that were used in the gas chambers against the Jews. But they didn't use the atabrine. <laughs> and in fact, in the North African campaign, our success was mainly because the U.S. forces used atabrine as a prophylactic, did not have much in the way of malaria, whereas Italians and Germans ran out of quinine and unfortunately suffered disease. So this is very important, and uh, the sign is just a reminder there from uh, Papua New Guinea where we also used it. If I can bring up the next slide, we'll see that there are actually four different strains of malaria, plus a zoonotic malaria strain that sometimes occurs. Uh, falciparum is the malignant form, the, the worst, the one that causes most of the death. Vivax and ovale are the tertiary uh, or, or tertiary uh, forms of malaria uh, in Africa and through uh, Southeast Asia primarily. 
And then malaria is one that's found um, well, throughout the world, but it's known as quartan malaria, as it only occurs every four days with the fevers rather than every three days. Uh, the Nalesi is the uh, zoonotic one of uh, long-tailed and pig mark uh, case in uh, Southeast Asia. If I can get the next slide, uh, we'll just briefly hit the symptoms so we all have the same starting point. Classic malaria is a cyclic fever. It uh, comes every three to four days. begins with a cold stage where the people feel chilly, sensation of headaches, uh, nausea, and vomiting as the temperature rises. And this is actually the best stage for uh, being able to diagnose on a blood test because the malaria parasites are more prevalent in the bloodstream at that point and much easier to detect. As we hit the fever stage, uh, the temperature goes to 39, 40.5 Celsius. Uh, people become very lethargic at this point. And as the fever breaks, they have a cold sweat and they're just profoundly fatigued and weak for the remainder of time. And most of the time, uh, particularly the Vivax and Ovale, uh, these cycles can continue a few times. People become a little immune to it and the symptoms begin to resolve. In the falciparum, though, they can go on to the more severe form of malaria, seen in the next slide. Um, and the worst, of course, being cerebral malaria, where they go into coma and could die. But they become profoundly anemic, hypoglycemic. Uh, in the black water fever form, they can actually get renal failure and begin bleeding into the blood and give the, the uh, black uh, urine electrolyte disturbances, jaundice, lactic acidosis, and of course eventually death in the falciparum malaria. Globally, um, malaria deaths are re-emerging as infectious killers. And in fact, this slide from uh, 2006 is a, a really good indicator of what was happening back then. Uh, we were seeing 2.1 million malaria deaths around the world. Uh, the good news is it's no longer causing that many deaths. And in fact, in the next slide, uh, you'll see that uh, even though it's causing death, um, the, the rate is really down. In fact, this is a Parati um, diagram. And it shows that 80% of all the malaria deaths in the world are to the left of side of the slide. Uh, that 80% is from 20% of the countries that actually have malaria. Um, in Nigeria, Congo, uh, India, Tanzania. And as you notice, most of these are African nations. And so we really need to focus on those countries and be more concerned about those countries as we travel. On uh, the next slide, uh, just some basic statistics. There are 3.2 billion people at risk for acquiring malaria. And this is down. It's down 37% between 2000 and 2015. And death rate is down from that disease 60% in the same time period. So even though the incidence is only down 37%, we're much more successful in treating it and preventing death. As of September of this year, there were 214 million cases globally. Uh, a small fraction of what was occurring back in 2006, 2007 on the previous slide. And there have only been 438,000 deaths, so less than a, a quarter of what was occurring back just 10 years ago. Um, and most of these are in Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa is 89% of the cases, 91% of the deaths. And the Real killer with this is, of course, the mosquito. On the next slide, you'll see an Anopheles mosquito. And you'll notice how this mosquito bites at about a 45 degree angle. And it's only the females. The males never bite humans. They don't carry the disease. It's only the females. Uh, I kind of tease my students and tell them that, hey, you can tell what disease you're going to get from the mosquito that's biting you and what angle it's at. Uh, you know, the 80s, which had the dengue and the yellow fever and some of the other diseases, uh, are horizontal, whereas Anopheles, the swamp mosquito, is a 45-degree um, angle feeder. And this particular mosquito, you can see the blood just filling that abdomen. And the good news is other diseases not transmitted by this mosquito include things like AIDS, um, because the transmission of disease through the mosquito requires replication in the uh, mid-gut and then transmission of that uh, bio, or excuse me, that, back, that um, parasite up to the salivary gland of the mosquito. So it's actually the bite itself 
that transmits disease. Okay, next slide, if we can. Um, how do we control this vector? And that's actually the first step in controlling malaria. And we can control the vector at a number of stages. Number one, we can look at the larva and reduce the source of the breeding sites. Um, the next slide actually shows a picture of some efforts a few years ago. And this slide uh, is, I think, from uh, about 1920 or so. Uh, the idea was, let's get rid of all the wetlands. We'll drain out all these swampy areas. If it's a swamp mosquito, uh, then if we can just get rid of the breeding site, we'll get rid of the malaria. Uh, and they were very successful at drying up wetlands. Unfortunately, they also got rid of all the other species that relied on those wetlands um, and did not manage to get rid of malaria. Uh, in fact, one of the jokes from the 50s and 60s was we've managed to get rid of, um, or we thought we'd get rid of the malaria, and what we've really gotten rid of is the malariologist. Um, they were all wrong about what they could accomplish. Um, I have a sign left over from probably the 1970 uh, vintage time period in Honduras, an area I go to frequently. And this is on the house uh, from 93 of a family that I worked with. And they were very proud of what they did to control malaria, uh, getting rid of some of these swampy areas. And unfortunately, malaria is still fairly prevalent in that area in 93. And I know friends from this particular village who have, in fact, died of malaria uh, because the disease has not been eliminated and is still a threat. Uh, next slide, back to some other ways of controlling those larvae. We can look at the chemical larviciding. Um, back when I was a young man, they used to put motor oil onto the surface of ponds to keep the mosquitoes from growing. Um, not a good idea. Uh, that is not biodegradable. It causes severe environmental harm. However, there are some biodegradable surface oils that can be used to prevent the uh, larvae from being able to breathe and within a few days degrade and then the water is perfectly usable and it doesn't hurt the other species. Uh, we can also control larvae by using bacteria. Bacillus thuringiensis is a, a great way. It is a parasite of the mosquito itself gets into the mosquito, kills the larvae, and does no harm to other things. Uh, we've also begun using some experimentation with growth regulators. Uh, methoprene is a good one uh, that's currently being investigated. The other option we have open to us is to use biological control. In this case, we would put in parasitic nematodes or fungi Unfortunately, they've not been very effective, and so therefore they're not uh, widely used. Uh, the, the issue there is you can put these out, um, and they work really well on the area where you put them, but they don't get out to the other areas, and so you still have mosquitoes breeding. Uh, another thing really good for your backyard, uh, predaceous mosquito fish, uh, some use, but again, studies haven't found them to be terribly effective. So the other option we have is to go on and try to work at the adult form of the disease. And, and here we go, here's my mosquito uh, eating fish. Um, can eat its weight in uh, parasite or in uh, the mosquito larvae each day. That's a, that's a lot of uh, larvae. Okay, so on to the adults. Um, how do you protect yourself from those? And these are actually the hallmark of what we do now in mosquito control on the next slide. Um, looking toward uh, personal protection like clothing, nets, repellents, and housing. Um, we've managed to get rid of malaria in the southeast United States where it used to be very common. Uh, in fact, back in the Civil War, uh, malaria was the leading cause of death amongst uh, soldiers on both sides of the conflict uh, here in the United States. Now we don't see it. Uh, in fact, we haven't seen malaria here probably in any form or fashion since the 40s except for a few isolated cases where it's reintroduced and quickly eliminated. And part of that is we have houses with screens and when we went to air conditioning um, basically people have very little contact with mosquitoes in the adult form at nighttime. Um, in other areas of the world where they don't have nice houses with screens and air conditioning uh, we have to rely on our clothing and bed nets and use of repellents. I always recommend if you're going to be out in the evening wearing long pants and wearing long sleeve shirts. 
uh, at nighttime using the mosquito nets. Uh, very, very effective at preventing the contact between people and the mosquito. Um, uh, I'll show you another picture in a little bit uh, about DDT used widely to put on those nets in the old days. Uh, now we have newer things. Uh, we're also beginning to look at uh, using sterile males released um, and it has been somewhat effective on a small scale. Uh, the problem of course is getting enough sterile males and getting the females to selectively breed with those males uh, to make it really a usable form of control. Uh, similarly, we can do genetic modification of the vector. This is still in development. The concept is if you can get mosquitoes perhaps that aren't able to carry the uh, malaria parasite, that would be good. Um, and we'll, we'll see where that comes to in the future. And so a lot of areas are uh, still used in emergency settings. We rely on the fogging spray. And I remember as a kid in the 50s and 60s, uh, we were still using widespread uh, fogging of areas that had um, a huge mosquito population just coming through with these big trucks and spraying at night uh, as the mosquitoes came out in hopes of killing it. In an emergency situation, useful, um, not so useful if you uh, just want to control the mosquitoes uh, and, and do this regularly because of the environmental damage. Um, you'll see uh, a 61 photo depicting the proper use of spray and this is from India and these guys are going through houses and spraying DDT onto the walls of the homes. Um, the Anopheles mosquito is kind of interesting in its behavior. It's a nocturnal feeder, in other words it waits till sunset, comes out and bites uh, other mosquitoes are daytime feeders. Well, during the daytime, the Anopheles mosquitoes likes to get onto a vertical surface, like the inside of your house on the wall. And so by spraying the walls, um, the mosquitoes can then be killed uh, when they come to rest during the daytime by the residual spray that was left there. And it works very well in and around huts. Unfortunately, you've all probably seen a red uh, Silent Spring, Rachel Carson's concern about the use of DDT. In fact, in the next slide, I have a can of DDT that uh, Don Thompson up at CMDA was able to find. He shared his can with me for photographs. Uh, and this is 6% DDT. This is a liquid coating that could be put on those walls. And that coating then would stay for years. Um, unfortunately, people were um, not too particular about how they used it and uh, because of the DDT it was able to get into the environment and cause the uh, destruction of the shells of osprey and so we withdrew it from the market. Uh, I think it still has some use and there has been some move uh, from World Health Organization to have limited use of this. Uh, we see a picture of a fellow being sprayed down in World War II uh, with DDT um, and this was used very widely in World War II and to humans no particular harm from the spray itself it was only to uh, the environment and to the birds out there as far as their eggs. Uh, I, I can't imagine though having somebody squirt DDT down my shirt. Uh, kind of interesting. Okay next slide. And so where are we at today? Uh, we don't use DDT. What do we have available to us? Uh, again, these mosquitoes are endophilic. They like being inside. They like being on walls and vertical. And so we spray judiciously. We can, to minimize the impact, we can still make use of this indoor residual spraying. Uh, the choice of insecticide is dependent on the local mosquito sensitivities. And in fact, with uh, some of the sprays we've used in the past, we have bred resistant mosquitoes. And that's very unfortunate. Um, to be effective, we have to get at least 80% of houses in the targeted areas uh, covered. And the sprays that we're currently using uh, remain effective for about three to six months. If we can get the next slide, uh, we can look at the types of sprays that we're using. Um, and we've found that by spraying regularly, we can reduce uh, the death in children from all causes about 20%. Currently, we're using uh, pyrethroid insecticides. Uh, they kill insects. Uh, these pyrethroids are actually made from uh, flowers, uh, flowers where the mosquitoes aren't able to feed. Um, and the males, in fact, feed on uh, vegetation for their source of um, 
nutrients as do females in addition to uh, the blood meal. Um, but the pyrethroids aren't toxic to humans or to mammals. Um, the nice thing about pyrethroids also is that when you expose them to water or sunlight, they break down, so the environmental impact is very, very small, if any. Uh, unfortunately, they do need to be re reapplied after 6 to 12 months. And so we've been to looking at long-lasting insecticides, trying to determine how best um, to be able to manage malaria. These longer-acting insecticides might remain effective for up to three years, even after repeat washing. And so you scrub down your walls, the insecticide remains there, or particularly in bed nets. Uh, if you wash a bed net, it would remain there and still give effectiveness, prevent children and adults uh, from uh, uh, contracting malaria in these areas. Uh, the World Health Organization has estimated that long-acting insecticides may save about $3.8 billion over the course of 10 years. And for the areas where malaria is prevalent, this would be a great savings and make a huge impact on the economy locally in some of these villages. Uh, right now, the World Health Organization has identified about 11 agents that can be used and others are currently under investigation. And if you're interested in looking at, there's a reference at the bottom of the slide, or you can just go to worldhealthorganization.it uh, and you can look at uh, those particular agents. The next slide actually shows a picture of a bed net. Um, and there's a problem with this bed net in use. Uh, this is at an orphanage where I've worked in Uganda. Um, and this uh, is a daytime photo, so the net is all tucked up, the kids are away, they're playing outside happily. Um, but there's a problem here. If the mosquitoes like to get on vertical surfaces, and they do, and they are coming into those areas during the daytime, this is an open invitation for the insect to come in. And so it's not uncommon for the Anopheles mosquito to fly under the bed net in the daytime when they're tucked up and then rest on, say, the bed post, which doesn't have uh, a residual spray, and it remains perfectly safe. And so I highly recommend during the daytime keep the bed nets tucked in to prevent any uh, mosquitoes from arriving in your bed because uh, there's nothing worse than waking up inside your bed net at night with a mosquito trapped inside with you. The next slide, we can look at um, the life cycle of malaria. And this is really the important part. To understand better how to control the mosquito with these agents, you have to understand the life cycle. Um, and I'll start with the left side of the slide um, with the mosquito. The mosquito bites somebody who's infected, and it picks up a blood meal. And again, it's the female mosquito that ingests the gametocyte, the sexually reproductive phase of malaria parasites. Um, inside the gut uh, of the m mosquito, the sexual gametes, the male and the female component, come together and form an ochakinate. Um, and this new form of the parasite forms the oocyst. These rupture and then the sporocytes reach into the salivary gland of the mosquito so that when the mosquito bites the next person, those are transmitted. It takes a single heartbeat for the sporozoite to go from the injection site of the mosquito to the human liver. And in, once inside the liver, then that parasite is protected against the human immune system as well as against many of the chemoprophylactic agents. Um, inside the human, there are actually two different cycles of reproduction for malaria. Um, the liver phase, or the exoerythrocytic uh, phase, um, a schizon is formed, and that schizon can actually go around with certain forms of malaria um, and reinfect other liver cells and those infected liver cells then become a source of infection for months, even years to come. I, I, I heard of a case many, many years ago of a lady who came down with Plasmodium malariae uh, 40 years after her last possible exposure. She'd made one trip out of uh, a northern latitude state in the U.S., um, and Boom, 40 years later, she had malaria because of that single trip outside of her state. 
Um, so it does happen. In most cases, about two to four weeks after um, developing infection in the liver, uh, the schizont will rupture. Those ruptured uh, parasites then enter the human bloodstream uh, where the immature trophozoite enters then into a red blood cell and begins this pattern of forming new schizonts. And every three days for the falciparum, the vivax, or valley form of malaria, the um, schizons will rupture out and reinfect new um, red blood cells forming a new series of infection. In the falciparum form of malaria, these can be very large number of parasites released in harmony and this is why falciparum is so dangerous. Uh, this cycle will continue every three days and each time the parasite erupts, there's new fever, new chills, and the patient becomes more profoundly fatigued. Um, on occasion, then instead of entering to a schizont phase, a gametocyte is formed, and if gametocytes are formed, then the human is infectious to the mosquito. And this goes on and on and on in many parts of the world. And again, 3.2 billion people at risk of acquiring this. Next slide shows the areas of the world where this disease is currently occurring. And I like this map because in one fell swoop it tells where the problem is, but also tells about our successes. And the colors indicate where we have problems. Red shows places where we are seeing an increase rate of mortality from malaria. And so the northern part of South America, and I believe that's Venezuela and Guyana, uh, Suriname I think is included in that area as well. Uh, whereas in areas like um, Brazil, we're seeing a large decrease. In fact, we're down 75% from just 15 years ago. Um, Mexico, people don't die. Many areas in the Middle East, people are no longer really dying of malaria, even though they may get it. Um, and then the areas in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, is where I really want to focus our attention because, again, 91% of the cases and 89% of the deaths. But notice that these are brown areas, and the death rate has actually decreased 25 49% in the dark areas, and by 50 to 74% in the lighter brown areas. So we're making great progress against malaria. Uh, but anytime you have somebody traveling from the US or from Europe and going to any of these areas indicated by any color other than white, you need to think about the risk of malaria. And you will decide how and to manage the malaria prophylaxis, what type to use according to what country and what type of activities they're going to do. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide, I want to talk about some things that have been used uh, as far as mass drug administration. Uh, the first concept was simply treat everybody for malaria within an endemic area. And we began experimenting with this back in the 1930s. Um, there would be no testing. You just treat everybody empirically as though they had malaria, uh, give a single curative dose, and kind of hope for the best. Um, not really recommended anymore. Uh, in fact, what we found is that mass drug administration, um, and if you go down on the slide, uh, did give a short-term reduction in malaria parasitemia among the population. In other words, if you went out and you did a screening to find out what the prevalence of malaria was within that population, you would go, yeah, it looks like it's pretty good. The problem is it wasn't interrupting the malaria transmission. And the real downside of this is because people were not um, totally eradicating malaria in the area, we were promoting drug resistance. And right now we have a huge problem with resistance. Um, quinine is still a great drug, but many of the synthetic forms like chloroquine and even mefloquine aren't working as well as they used to. And I don't even think we use atabrine anywhere anymore. Um, so we started thinking about newer variations of mass drug administration. And some of these might have some merit. Uh, certainly we could target MDA in hot zones. If we're seeing an area where we're getting really heavy, heavy burden of disease, we might want to treat everybody 
just to try and get things under control. We can also think about the chemoprophylactic or preventive uh, strategies. And some of these involve doing mass screening and then treatment. And so the idea is you go in where you know you've got highly endemic areas, you identify those who have recognizable parasitemia, and you treat them, and you treat them very well, and you recheck them, and you retreat them if you need to. Um, another idea would be to simply take all those who simply have fever and empirically treat those. And I know a lot of us, when we're in the mission field, where we may not have lab support, do that. Uh, if you know you got malaria in there, you know you've got a high uh, incidence of malaria, you may want to consider doing that uh, simply to keep it under control. Okay, so in the next slide, um, I'll talk a little bit about some of those intermittent strategies that we can use. And one of them is the seasonal strategy of chemo prevention. Um, and this has been a strict, strict strategy that's been used in the sub-Saharan Africa in Africa for s some time. And since we know children at the, are most at risk, and particularly those under five, we go to all of those children under the age of five years during the high transmission season, i.e. the rainy season, and then we give monthly curative doses. Um, these countries are currently using um, amidiquin plus uh, the old Fancidar, uh, not available here in the U.S. anymore, but certainly used uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. And this seems to work fairly effectively. Uh, we can also look at pregnant women. Pregnant women that are in those high to moderate uh, areas of transmission uh, are at more risk of complications. And you can use Fancidar as a medical intervention and intermittently just treat these women when they come in. And the concept here is if you do an intermittent preventive treatment at each scheduled antenatal visit after the first trimester, and this important underline here, after the first trimester, uh, Fancidar is not real good for developing babies in that first trimester, but after the first trimester, um, it can be given fairly safely, uh, very similar to using uh, Bactrim uh, for UTIs don't want to use it in the first trimester, but after the first trimester, a uh, fairly safe drug. Um, and so you can give this, and it does reduce the risk of disease and reduce the bad outcomes in the pregnancy as well. And then finally, we can look at infants in those high transmission areas of Africa and give um, Fancidar when they come in for their vaccinations. You can give three doses of an intermittent preventive treatment and just deliver that right alongside all their vaccines. And it keeps these young, young children, who again are going to be the most vulnerable and most likely to die, from getting the disease at all. So very effective. So the, one of the questions is, well, why not get a uh, vaccine for malaria? I am happy to report that we have finally arrived at a vaccine. Uh, this has been a long time coming. Uh, and it was just uh, this year that a malaria vaccine has become available. The vaccine is called Mosquitorix, um, RTSX, um, and it has been a, like I say, since 1987 trying to get this vaccine to market. Um, and it took the collaborative effort of the uh, Water Reed Army Institute for Research. Uh, it took the Malaria Vaccine Initiative it took the Gates Foundation, and I want to thank them. Um, there's a lot of money required to make this, and it brings tears to the eyes to think of the lives that will be saved from this vaccine. And um, thanks to uh, GSK for bringing this back and sticking with it since 87. Uh, phase three trials completed in 2014. The publication was put out in spring of 2015, so this is very new. Uh, unfortunately, only effective for falciparum, but you know what? That's the one that caused the death, so I, I think we have a good chance of this working. Initial series is three doses. It does reduce clinical malaria about 26 to 36 percent, and I know you're thinking, gosh, only 26 to 36 percent. This is, I'll take it. Um, statistics are great. Um, you know, if you say it, you know, it's just a statistic, it's a little number. If you happen to be the little number in the statistics, it's important. Uh, it does require a fourth dose as a booster after 18 months to remain efficacious. 
Um, unfortunately, the usefulness is limited geographically to those areas where, where falciparum uh, predominates. Uh, what's kind of fun with this particular vaccine, if vaccines can ever be fun, is that uh, in October of 2015, so just a few weeks ago, a pilot program was implemented for this vaccine and it was recommended by two different uh, World Health Organization advisory groups. Um, and so I'm pretty excited of what's going to happen. It'll be fun watching over the next year or two or three what happens with this pilot program. And uh, a year or two from now, we may be recommending going into areas and giving every child a vaccine against malaria. And so this is exciting news. Okay, so what about the rest of us that are traveling? Um, Travel does give us a risk, and I will tell you that people like me, old white folks, are very much at risk of malaria. Uh, the highest estimated relative risk of infection for travelers is to West Africa and to Oceania, those areas in the South Pacific particularly. So chemoprophylaxis should always be used in these areas, and I don't care who you are. If you're going to some other areas of the world, um, other areas of Africa, Southeast uh, Asia, or South Asia, South America. I'm just getting ready to go down to Honduras. Um, there's an area where I may need to think about it. You have to assess the travel plan to determine whether medication is needed. And things to consider is rainfall. Is this the wet area of the country or is it the dry area of the country? If more rainfall means more mosquitoes, more swamp means more mosquitoes. Think about the seasonality. You know, if it's the dry season, you may get by without prophylaxis. If it's the wet season, you better not forget it. Elevation is also an important factor. Um, mosquitoes don't like it at high elevation. Uh, love Pikes Peak when I go out to Colorado. No mosquito bites there. Um, but as you go higher in elevation, there are less mosquitoes. Magic cutoff actually depends on the temperature, but about 15 to 2,500 meters. Uh, tends to be the limit of mosquito survival. It does raise the question of what happens if we have climate change, if we're getting more uh, high temperatures in more areas of the world, do we need to think about this you know, for more people? Uh, rural versus urban, certainly consideration. In cities, typically not as much risk of malaria. Now, I'm going to Honduras, as I said, I went at Tegucigalpa. Nice urban area, nice high elevation, not a problem for me as long as I stay inside the city and don't go down the hill. Uh, and then local occurrence. Uh, I always call my local missionary and say, hey, you seen any malaria in the clinics there? If they're seeing malaria, you better believe I'm going to be prescribing uh, prophylaxis for myself and for others. Um, as we come down, lower risk in Central America and other parts of Asia. Um, and then we have to think about areas where there are limited mosquito tran or malaria transmission. Uh, is mosquito avoidance alone sufficient? And many times it is. And in those areas, I wouldn't take the risk of having chemoprophylaxis. So what do you give? And this is always uh, a big toss-up. A lot of this is personal preference, but a lot of it is also uh, what are the prevailing strains? What are we seeing there? Um, the popular drug right now is the amalarone. Uh, comes as a fixed dose tablet, 250 and 100 milligram. It also comes in a pediatric version, which is nice. Uh, of course, the old standby is the chloroquine, 500 milligrams each week. Um, the daily it may be a little bit easier for people to remember than the weekly, um, though chloroquine is much cheaper than amalarone. Uh, and I tell people when I prescribe the chloroquine, take it each week on Sunday and be religious about it. That way, kind of a mnemonic to help them remember. Uh, doxycycline, another great daily drug uh, for treatment. It's a slower drug, but it is very effective as prophylaxis. It also prevents some of the traveler's diarrhea and uh, some of the amoebas and things like that. Um, the problem is that it is pretty nasty on the stomach for some people. And recently, the price has gone up dramatically in the United States, not so much in other parts of the world, but in the U.S., uh, because they've taken the generic off the market and you end up with the brand names, uh, which make it higher price. And uh, I, I really, if there are any people from pharmaceutical companies, we really need to think about making these drugs more available on the generic uh, formularies uh, because they're life-saving. And, um, you know, we have to think about people's lives over profit sometimes, and I'll get off the soapbox. 
Um, mefloquine, another weekly drug, great drug, very useful. I don't use it much. Uh, the reason is we are beginning to see some resistance to it uh, amongst malaria strains. And uh, a lot of people, particularly those who use alcohol, will get these strange hallucinations. Uh, I remember a friend that I prescribed this for a few years back uh, from Italian background and she had a glass of wine one night with her spaghetti dinner after she arrived home and when she woke up in the middle of the night she had this vivid conversation with her dearly departed grandmother who had been gone for five years and swore that it was as real as any conversation she'd ever had um, and so she begged me not to give her that drug ever again. Another drug, uh, Primaquin, very useful, um, particularly in Southeast Asia. It is a daily drug. It is not as effective against um, the falciparum, but works very well for Vivax, um, and particularly in Southeast Asia, where you're more concerned about uh, the liver form of the uh, parasite. And uh, so sometimes I use it there, though I tend to use it more for people after they return as a, a radical cure. Uh, in the next couple of slides, I just sort of go over some of the highlights of uh, the disease and uh, the use of the drugs. Um, Malarone, great for last minute travelers, and so that's where I use this one most. Really good for short term trips, uh, really good for those people that like uh, the daily medication. Um, you can start this one a day or two before leaving, and you only have to take it for seven days after traveling. And some people really like that. The downside, and this is really expensive, runs nine or ten dollars per tablet. Um, so if you're out for 30 days, this gets really pricey really quick. And you can't use it in pregnant women or if a woman is uh, breastfeeding a child less than five kilos. And you can't use it when somebody has severe uh, renal impairment. So you need to really watch your diabetics and hypertensives to make sure they're not uh, picking up renal involvement before they make a trip. Uh, chloroquine. This is still my go-to drug. Uh, it is weekly. It is cheap. It's available just about everywhere you might go. Um, but there are areas that have chloroquine resistance. So south uh, part of uh, Africa, you just don't want to use this because there's too much resistance. Um, and so it's not a good tr choice for Africa. Um, there are GI effects. I found it works better if you take it with your food. Um, and it can be used safely in all trimesters of pregnancy. Uh, I had a, a lady a few years back, in fact, that came to the U.S. after a trip to Africa. And though we couldn't cure her of her malaria uh, at, in her first trimester, I was able to use chloroquine on her, keep down the malaria parasite until I was able to safely treat her. And so it, very useful that way. The other nice thing about chloroquine is it's very closely related to hydroxychloroquine. And so if you have a patient with rheumatologic disorders, um, you may be able to adjust the dose of the hydrochloroquine and uh, hydroxychloroquine and not have to have on an additional medication while they're traveling. And it works equally effective. Um, the downside is it does have to be taken for four weeks after return. And people frequently forget to take it for the full four weeks. Um, and plus, it's not a real good uh, drug for last minute travelers because it does have to be started a week or two in advance. Uh, moving on to doxycycline, I already mentioned uh, that it has become more expensive because it's not available on our generic list here in the US. Uh, but again, you may have some people that are taking doxy as a preventive medication uh, for their acne, <coughs> um, particularly your teenagers who are traveling. Um, and as I said, it also prevents a number of additional infections, uh, rickettsial diseases, leptospirosis, some of the uh, diarrheal diseases. Um, but again, the disadvantage can't use it in pregnant women and cannot use it in children under eight years of age. Uh, this one also must be continued for about four weeks. Um, be real careful when using this in women because they will get a vaginal infection after four weeks of uh, daily doxycycline. Um, so you just have to plan on it. I just give the script and a couple refills for uh, use of uh, some sort of a uh, antifungal uh, to protect them against that. Doxycycline also causes stomach upset, but again, for a teenager who's already used to using it, uh, go for it. 
And then mefloquine, I think I've already covered pretty much the nasty side effects of the psychiatric problems with this. And uh, you don't want to give this to somebody who already has problems with hallucinations because they will hallucinate. Um, it is a good choice, though, for long trips because it is only taken weekly and it can be used in pregnancy. And in some areas with chloroquine resistance, it does work somewhat effectively. Um, so again, you can use this one. Uh, the other group that you don't want to use this is in people with uh, seizure disorders and those with cardiac uh, abnormalities. Primaquin, again, a good choice for long trips because it's only taken weekly. Um, and it, it um, can be, and it's on the next slide, if you will. It, uh, or excuse, used uh, on a daily basis. It's only needed for seven days after traveling. Uh, can be started last minute, uh, but you must check for D6PD deficiency prior to travel. And there's cost involved with that and delays uh, involved with that and you shouldn't use it in pregnant women. So moving on, let's look at diagnosis now. And the uh, first slide in my diagnostic section is the blood films. Uh, and this is the way that we used to do it, and we still do this. Uh, thicken a film, thin smear. Uh, thin film made by pulling one slide over the other. It looks very good for screening because you can look quickly. The problem is you spread out the parasites enough that it's hard to uh, pick up uh, very low parasitemia, and the thick film is better for that. Uh, I used to spend hours doing this with my GIMP sustain, and you're looking for parasites like this. This one shows a schizont in the next slide, right there in the center, and if you look out to the right-hand side of the slide, there's actually a trophozoite of uh, the uh, parasite as well. In the next slide, uh, again, some schizonts and um, of, and some trophozoites of the disease. And this is actually a trophozoite of a plasmodium vivax in the center of the slide. And the next slide, a ring form of falciparum in the center stage. And there on the next slide is a gametocyte. Um, people see these all the time and worry about them. This means the person is not a risk to themselves. They're just a risk to the mosquito uh, and not a worry. Bad news about these is it really takes somebody who's experienced looking at the slides. And we have moved on now to something that's a little bit more idiot proof, something that doesn't take the technical skill or the time and patience. And something that's very useful in a field where there's limited lab resources. And that's the uh, immunochromographic antigen test. Works very similar to uh, the rapid strep test that uh, many of you are used to. And it's capable of detecting two different antigens uh, at the same time. The first antigen is specific to Plasmodium falciparum, the one that's most likely to cause death. Uh, the second antigen is a pan-malarial antigen that's common for all four human malaria parasites. We'll find that this is useful then to differentiate between falciparum and the less fatal species. And as you test, you'll get two marks coming up in the block. Um, the first one is for the pan, for the uh, falciparum specifically, and the second one is for the pan-malarial. Uh, clinical limited detection for parasitemia, uh, that is an infected blood that produces results 95%, and that is what you're looking for. Next slide. Um, for falciparum, you need about 1,001 to 15,000 parasites per microliter to be able to uh, differentiate for the... Uh, Vivax, you need about 5,000 to 5,500 parasites per um, um, microliter uh, to be able to find it. And it takes about 15 minutes to complete, and it has to be stored between 36 and 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So it is a little bit of a problem if you put it in your backpack and you're at 110 degrees, uh, but uh, there are ways around that, and it's very useful. Uh, I recently had a patient came in my office here, my academic office uh, from Indonesia, and brought his malaria uh, test kit with him and had symptoms and sure enough tested positive uh, for Vivax. Um, so again, very useful for expats when they come back home. Okay, so coming toward the end here on the next slide, recurrence of malaria. It is possible that you can get reinfection after treatment, and this happens all the time for missionaries and for travelers and for um, natives 
of the areas where malaria occurs. And it's not uncommon for me to have a student who's from Africa who tells me, yeah, I was treated for malaria a dozen times when I was growing up. Um, unfortunately, it's also possible to have recurrence in malaria for people who have left the malaria area. Uh, and there are two types that occur. Uh, the first is re a relapse, and this is seen in Plasmodium vivax and Plasmodium ovale. And what happens with that is the, these particular strains of uh, Plasmodium can set up a liver cycle and remain dormant as hypnozoites in the liver and then reemerge from the liver after treatment for uh, malaria in the bloodstream. And I see this all the time. Uh, particularly from those people going to Southeast Asia and uh, Indonesia and that region of the world where Vivax is very common. Uh, I remember a, a young fellow one year who had been treated at least twice that I know of before he came to see me and came down with malaria again and I realized that it had to be a relapse uh, because he was treated adequately I know the second time and so we treated him with a radical cure with primaquine because that is able to get into uh, the liver and destroy the liver phase of disease and he had no further recurrence. Uh, so that's relapse. It's also possible to get recrudescence and this occurs when you have an incomplete or inadequate treatment um, and this can be a result of drug resistant or improper choice of medication. In other words, if I got somebody that's coming from Sub-Saharan Africa and they have malaria and I throw mefloquine at it which is a great drug um, and they manage not to have hallucinations they think I'm the best thing since sliced bread because their malaria is gone but then a week later they're sick again well the reason is they had a bug that was resistant to the mefloquine and the mefloquine killed most of the parasites but not all of the parasites and those few parasites that survive are now very, very resistant to my mefloquine and they will pop out a month later uh, with recurrence of disease and that is recrudescence and typically you'll see that in fairly short order. Um, next slide, what do we treat with and this is what you really need to know about if you're going to be doing a clinic overseas uh, or if you see patients as I frequently do or get phone calls from patients as I frequently do um, who are here in the States. Uh, if it's an uncomplicated sensitive falciparum or any other species, you can use chloroquine phosphate. Works really well. Uh, give two tablets uh, initially, uh, then six hours later you give a tablet, and then at 24 and 48 hours um, you give another tablet. Um, and you can use hydroxychloroquine just the same way, Plaquenil. Um, I will tell you if you have a patient that's hospitalized, write your orders very specifically. I had a lady, um, and this has been probably 10, 15 years ago, uh, was hospitalized for malaria. I wrote this script uh, in her chart just this way, and there was the order. Um, and they had only two pills in the pharmacy. They gave her two pills, and they ordered more pills from a local pharmacy which was unfortunately closed that night and they didn't get it until the next day. Well, the next day they gave one pill and they gave one at 48 hours and unfortunately the lady did not get enough and she had a relapse, a, a recurrence of disease because of inadequate treatment. Um, and so when I write an order in hospital um, now I would write give one tablet now give one tablet or give two tablets now give one tablet and put my six hour put the exact time um, so that the nurses know don't delay this stuff when it's convenient and when you get the drug uh, it must be on this schedule to work and then 24 hours is 24 hours after that first pill and you go from there next slide um, and for uh, Vivax and Ovalley, um, you do have to worry about the risk of relapse from residual hepatic schizons. So typically, uh, I will follow this with a radical cure. Next slide, uh, to eradicate them, add the primaquine 30 milligrams a day for 14 days. Just realize you can't use this with pregnancy, so you may see some relapses. You just watch it carefully 
and then you treat after the pregnancy is over. Next slide. Um, so what if you've got somebody who has a resistant vivax? Say they're coming from Papua New Guinea or Indonesia. Uh, for those patients, malarone works really well. And you get four tablets daily for three days. And you don't have to be as picky about this one. And it works fairly uh, effectively. Uh, it's giving a combination drug. Um, alternatively, you can go to the old standby, quinine, which was what we used before at Brine. In fact, what the Brits used uh, throughout uh, World War II. Um, and most of you know the story about tonic and the Brits' love for gin and tonic. The gin was basically to cover the taste of the quinine. Um, the problem with the quinine is it works really well um, to get rid of what's in the blood right now, but it doesn't get rid of what's in the liver, and so you have to use something in addition. So you have to add doxycycline or tetracycline or clindamycin and continue that for seven days. Uh, quinine does take uh, three times a day dosing, and you have to continue for seven days uh, beyond the first dose. Uh, Additionally, you could use mefloquin, um, and mefloquin is used as three tablets initially, followed by two tablets every six to 12 hours later. Uh, and again, following with primaquin is really useful unless the uh, patient is pregnant. And in fact, to point out doxycycline and tetracycline can't be used in pregnancy either. All right. So for the next slide, uncomplicated resistant falciparum. Uh, or if you don't know the sensitivity. Uh, I assume that if somebody is coming from Sub-Saharan Africa, they have resistant falciparum. It's just a safe thing to do. The drug to go to is the malarone. Four tablets daily for three days. Uh, alternatively, you could use Caratim. Um, this is actually wormwood. And you remember from scripture about giving wormwood um, made people sick. Well, we've identified the group of drugs or compounds within the wormwood, and this is one of those. It's given us four tablets per dose, very, very effective. Um, or we could go back to the old quinine. Next slide. Um, our mefloquin is still useful. Again, I tend to avoid that one because of the hallucinations. Um, newer drug, uh, also made from wormwood, um, artisanate. It's a newer option. Uh, is available in many parts of the world uh, and is the drug of choice according to World Health. Just recently become available in the U.S., uh, but it is investigational, so you have to call the hotline to get it from the CDC. Uh, so the standard treatment in the U.S. Uh, is to follow the uh, quinidine um, or to go with uh, the doxycycline and tetracycline or clindamycin uh, after uh, the doxycycline. And can we move forward to the next slide because that's the artisanate, uh, which I've already talked about. And with that, I think we are to our references, yes. So we've got just a couple minutes left for our questions, I think. Richard, I can start off while we're waiting for questions. Um, can you just uh, elaborate a little bit more about um, ACT, uh, artemisinin combination therapy, and, and, um, and, and how do you think that plays a role in treatment? Sure. Uh, the bottom line is what you want to do is try and get all those resistant organisms under control. And so when we go with the combination therapies, we're working at different ends. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's sort of like TB therapy. You know, we used to use INH all the time. INH was a great drug, except mm -hmm. we had resistance. So you look at biochemical pathways within the parasite, or in the case of TB, within the bacteria, so that you're disrupting two biochemical pathways at the same time, less yeah. likely to get resistance, therefore much more effective. Yeah. With, with that in mind, uh, Richard, do you think, um, should we uh, utilize um, combination therapy more often as opposed to single agent therapy? In fact, I think we're beginning to move toward that. Um, and that's kind of the idea with, um, and making that more available to people uh, that are going to some of these areas. Um, and using the uh, malarone, you already have a combination therapy. Uh, exactly. That's a good option as well. Right. Dr. Lane, it says some of our missionaries are using um, papaya leaf tea or other uh, uh, botanicals. What do you think of that with yeah. regard? 
The, the answer is a lot of these haven't been evaluated clinically um, in good uh, testing, good mm -hmm. clinical test uh, to show any efficacy. Mm -hmm. um, and in lack of evidence, I would stick with what we have evidence for. Uh, that's good practice to know that what you're using is actually going to work. Right. Um, and like I say, many of the botanicals that are out there have been disproven, or they're just not as effective as they need to be. Right. Yeah, I think you do have to use caution with botanicals. As you said, they may not be definitively proven there. Um, uh, Dr. Lane, uh, another question. It says, what regions do you still use chloroquine as prophylaxis? Uh, I use them in Latin America very regularly. And in fact, I was just down in a rural area in near a river in Guatemala just a few months ago and took chloroquine myself for that. Christian Connections and International Health, it says, do you have a favorite prevention uh, education campaign uh, you have seen or style of education you think is most effective? For malaria prophylaxis or for malaria nets? Because there's a difference and it depends on the target audience. Uh, for my kids that are leaving from the university going on mission trips, and we send a lot here. Uh, in fact, we have a collaborative effort with Samaritan's Purse, LU Send Now, uh, for disaster relief. Um, uh, then I talk to them about taking their medications and about using bed nets when they're traveling. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think for them, you just have to talk about, you want your mother to be happy. That works really well for my students, because uh, otherwise their mothers don't want them to travel. If I'm working in a village, though, where I'm talking about bed nets, uh, what I try to do is create something more sustainable. Um, and so I educate people as to what malaria is in their area, um, and they can see malaria occurring. They know, they have the idea of the reality. And their main barrier is the cost of the nets and the cost, particularly when they're impregnated. So we do a training where they can actually make their own nets and use their own insecticides, in fact, even make their own pyrethroids, uh, to be able to impregnate those nets and go through the process so that they have ownership of it. And I found that where you can have people take ownership, it's much more effective. Okay, I, I guess we have time for just one last question. Uh, it says, are we ever going to eradicate malaria globally? If yes, uh, what is the science behind it? Yeah, the answer is we're, we're not to the point that we can talk about that. And the last time we talked about it, we got rid of our malariologist. Um, you know, I, I think we certainly will decrease the risk of malaria. We can certainly... Uh, decrease the risk of death from malaria, but I think uh, eliminating malaria as a disease um, is quite distant future. Um, to be able to get there, we number one have to have a vaccine that's more effective than the current one that we're piloting. Um, we would need to be able to find something that would get rid of all resistance, mm -hmm. um, and we'd need to be able to effectively uh, get people to the point that economically afford the control methods in every single spot of the world. And, and I think that's still a distant, distant hope. Yes. Um, you know, so for now, let's just stick with eradicating polio and measles and guinea worm. Uh, All right. Yeah, I think that's ambitious enough. That is. So, um, Dr. Lane, um, we really want to thank you for just a, a fantastic presentation uh, with regard to updates with, uh, with malaria. Um, our listening audience, I just want to remind you about our CME credit. Uh, please submit uh, your answers as uh, instructed in the email. Um, we will, uh, in the uh, next day or two, we will be uh, sending out the uh, link to this recording uh, and, so that you can share that and, and watch it again um, uh, to um, learn more about malaria. Um, also, I just want to encourage you, under the video there, you see that uh, email link. Um, that you can uh, um, uh, link into that to uh, sign up uh, for additional um, DART, or excuse me, additional um, uh, webinars um, in the future. And, and please share that uh, with uh, your friends and colleagues because we are trying to grow um, uh, this uh, webinar very much. Um, and then finally, also, I just want to encourage you that uh, here at uh, Samaritan's Purse, uh, we do have uh, a DART. Uh, medical response team. If you're uh, interested uh, in signing up for that, I encourage you to um, 
uh, link on to samaritanspersh.org slash dart um, and there's an application that you can uh, apply for that. Um, lastly, I just want to advertise uh, next month in December we will have uh, Dr. Henry Perry uh, who's from Johns Hopkins University uh, who is an excellent presenter and will be presenting why community-based primary health care uh, and community health care workers are so important. Um, and so with that, uh, we'd like to conclude. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next month.